Author Neil Gaiman said, the stories you read at the right age never quite leave you. Hey, I'm Chloe, and I think our buddy Neil is right. I'm convinced the stories that impact us as kids and teens really do have a magical way of sticking around. So books must have been written for young adults forever, right? Wrong. Like jeans or Broadway musicals, young adult fiction is a relatively recent American invention. The genre was pioneered by women in the 20th century, and its popularity today is undeniable. In the last five years, YA revenues have grown nearly 40%. Over 30,000 YA books are published each year, with dystopia and sci-fi leading the charge. Those super popular dystopias feel eerily similar to the COVID-19 pandemic. It's almost like the genre predicted it and the teens saw it coming. So how did YA become so prominent today? And are the dystopia-obsessed teens onto something? Let's track that. In the 1920s, a team of woke librarians at the New York Public Library pulled out books for 12 to 18-year-old readers, or young people, as they called them. Older librarians criticized their younger colleague, Mabel Williams, because she was focused on welcoming more young people to the library. But Mabel said, get out, old ladies. Literally. In 1929, Mabel created the library's first annual Books for Young People list for nationwide reference. And it's still around today. Some of the books on the list were Little Women and Anne of Green Gables. The books on the lists weren't really written for teenagers, but putting them together helped a teenage market emerge. Well, if you could call it a teenage market. Before books could be written for teenagers, teens needed to exist. And before the 30s, they kind of, well, didn't. Hear me out. Before the Great Depression, many kids were thrown right into the workforce. A lot of them were only 10. Only 50% of the American population enrolled in high school at the time. But the Depression cut out a lot of jobs, and the Fair Labor Standards Act of 1938 limited child labor. So more kids stayed in school, and more kids could have a teenage experience, priming Americans to tell teen stories. Lit! I mean, swell! In the 1940s and 50s, the teenage love story trope became a thing. Sue Barton's Student Nurse and 17th Summer were big hits around the war because they were pretty optimistic. A lot of people dissed them though, calling them junior novels, but eh, whatever. In 1944, Margaret Scoggin, the newest and coolest librarian at the New York Public Library, wrote an article saying that more energy needs to be focused on young adults. Yeah, she coined the term young adults. Over a decade later, the American Library Association created a Young Adult Services Division. And a decade after that, just as a bunch of baby boomers came of age, YA entered its first golden age. The Outsiders by S.E. Hinton was published in 1967, and it's credited for starting the YA genre. The novel is about gritty teen gang warfare, and Hinton wrote it when she was only 17. Her realistic focus on intense teen subjects was groundbreaking, and provided the base for what YA would become. Jennifer Wolfe, an instructor who teaches YA at Stanford, agrees. It was offered to teens to reflect back to them something about themselves, about adolescent development, about what it means to be an outsider and an insider. YA is meant to reflect adolescents back to adolescent readers, so it just functions as a mirror. Hinton knew she was making a pretty big impact. At 19 years old, she wrote an op-ed for the New York Times saying, the world is changing, yet the authors of books for teenagers are still 15 years behind the times. Writers needn't be afraid that they will shock their teenage audience, but give them something to hang on to. Do it realistically. Earn respect by giving it. Oh, and they gave it all right. A whole new wave of, quote, problem novels were published right after the civil rights movement. Readers and authors were motivated to confront serious social issues with titles like Go Ask Alice and The Contender, which finally featured the first protagonist of color in YA. It's about time. The problem novel lost interest in the 80s and 90s. Serialized fiction like the Goosebumps books and the Sweet Valley High series took over the market, but they were considered pretty juvenile. YA was literally on the brink of extinction during this post-Golden Age period. That is, until 1997, when a certain magical wizard flew onto the page and saved the day. That's right, Harry Potter started the second Golden Age of young adult literature. So how did YA's popularity stick around for so long? 
First, it became uncool to disrespect YA. Harry Potter made it socially acceptable for kids and adults to enjoy it. And in 1999, the Prince Award for YA Excellence was created, which gave the genre some street cred for the first time. It earned respect by giving it. Thanks for the wisdom, Hinton. Second, publishers started marketing directly to teens, which weirdly hadn't happened yet. And last but not least, YA experienced a lot of internal changes in the 2000s, which helped everything stay fresh. In the early 2000s, fantasy series like Percy Jackson and City of Bones quickly followed Harry Potter. Then John Green popularized 21st century teenage realism, which was supplemented by paranormal romances thanks to that sexy Twilight vampire whom I love to hate. Then, finally, in 2008, The Hunger Games started the huge dystopia trend. In the past decade, the We Need Diverse Books movement made massive strides. New stories have focused on justice and equality, race relations, LGBTQ issues, mental illness, science fiction, and yes, disease. Jennifer isn't sure what's next for the genre, but she has some theories. I'm really interested to see how the political situation of the last four years slash one year is going to find its way in YA. We haven't seen politics explicitly covered. We haven't seen Donald Trump as a character. So maybe that's out there. Our world today feels like a YA dystopia. And many people are reaching to those novels to cope. Why? Well, Reading can help us consolidate our emotional experiences in a contained way. We immerse ourselves in the safety of another world to understand our own world from a distance. There's a lot of psychology behind that. In dystopias, people are drawn to the resilience of the characters as they not only survive, but try to lead meaningful lives in the aftermath of disaster. In these types of novels, we're led to ask ourselves, how could I survive that too? In many ways, that's what teens have been doing all along. When they read YA, they ask themselves, could I survive the horrors of the teenage experience too? How? Today, adult readers seem to have rediscovered the value of that emotional guidance. Perhaps the cautionary tales in YA could and should support everyone. Chloe Winterstein, Peninsula Press.